Very good evening, everyone, um, and welcome. Can you just take your seats? I think I know almost all of you. Peter Coldrax is my name. I'm the Vice Chancellor of QUT. And it's uh, great to welcome all of you, um, school principals, deputies, um, a couple of school guidance officers as well, uh, I know are here. Uh, we welcome you all. Uh, as I think you know, we take very seriously indeed uh, uh, our association, our engagement with the schools. Uh, we're always interested in what feedback you have for us regarding what we're doing well or not so well. Uh, and we're very interested on an occasion like this through the opportunity that you have to quiz us and raise some issues to hear about what's on your minds. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin, though, by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, of uh, this place, uh, this space, um, and, the, and recognise the important and continuing contribution that Indigenous people play in the life and the work of QUT. And as I'm sure almost all of you are aware, we've just had Reconciliation Week, which of course is very important uh, in our national history, because in that week uh, there is a recognition both of the significance of the Mabo decision, uh, and if you're around long enough, as a few of us were, the 1967 referendum uh, on Aboriginal recognition, which uh, to this day remains um, the most successful referendum, referendum proposition ever put with something like a 90.77 plurality at the time. So um, all of those things are important and, uh, and that recognition uh, is important. The, the pack drill for tonight is going to be reasonably um, simple. I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes, uh, after which we'll have something to eat. Then uh, fairly early in the course of the evening, uh, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Stephen Harrington and Dr. John Banks, who are two of our senior lecturers in the Creative Industries faculty. And they're going to speak to us on the topic, do we need an antidote or a chill pill, young people and social media? Uh, we recognise that in this room, there's a huge amount of knowledge um, of, uh, of young people. Uh, I hope the perspectives of Stephen and John um, are helpful and interesting, and I'm sure you'll provide them with, with some guidance as well. As I said, I'm going to speak for uh, 10 or 15 minutes at the very most. I'm going to say a little bit about QUT. I'm going to say more, though, about what's going on nationally, uh, and then wrap it up with some other um, local issues as well. Uh, in one slide, that, I guess, uh, paints a picture of where we're going as a university. We've been seeking to strengthen our position uh, in the school lever market, as well as in other markets, over a period of time. And we're pleased to say that the, the pattern we've been exhibiting for a period of time continues and continues uh, to strengthen. The positioning in the OP1 to 6 bands uh, uh, is important. Uh, and also, it's important and relevant to point out that we've been tightening, that is, lifting OP cutoffs. Um, in, in consecutive years. And there was something of a fable around the sector that a demand-driven system with many more students in the system would lead to lower cutoffs. Well, that hasn't been the picture that we've experienced at QUT. Uh, getting to business now, I've got three slides in relation to the federal budget. Uh, one is the characterisation of the new system that the government is proposing. Another slide relates to the impact on students, and another, the broader impact on QUT. So what the government has done, and I'm not going to run through these, I'll just talk about them. What the government has done is to, is to deregulate the system, and it has a couple of things in mind when it says it's going to deregulate the system. It is allowing new players to enter the higher education market, and uh, it's proposing uh, to allow the possibility of funding sub-degree and diploma level activities by new players, typically um, private players uh, or others. Uh, the pot of money that is currently available, as it were, will have to also accommodate the, accommodate the appetites, as it were, of the new players who are let through the Texa the, 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 the TEXA gate or the TEXA hurdle. TEXA being the national regulator, which looks at the quality of people who are applying to be registered providers. 
Um, in practical terms, so that's one dimension. There are new players being uh, admitted to uh, the national system. Uh, secondly, uh, universities are being given freedom to uh, levy the fees that they would wish. And uh, there has been some push from, uh, from the older universities in particular for this very model to be, uh, for this very model to be pursued. And the government's done that. I don't think that QUT is overly concerned about its competitive position in the market. But we are very concerned about the consequences, potentially, of the changes for our students, particularly low-income students and Indigenous students, of course. Um, we are in a slightly better position than other universities. Uh, that is to say, we've developed a fighting fund over the last decade or so called the Learning Potential Fund, uh, which is a perpetual fund which now has $27 million in that fund from which we've been able to fund about 15,000 scholarships and bursaries. We initially thought $20 million would do it. We revised that a year or two ago, having some idea that this sort of thing could happen. A revised target is a $50 million perpetual fund. And it wouldn't surprise me if it crept to closer to 75 million fairly quickly. Now, one of the, one of the better elements um, in the new framework uh, does require universities um, to, uh, to uh, to uh, deliver a proportion of the fees that they receive uh, in the direction of equity scholarships or similar activities. There are a lot of methodological issues that need still to be sorted out around that, but QUT won't take any encouragement to do that. QUT will allocate at least 20% of fees. But in practical terms for the university, um, what it means is that um, the amount of Commonwealth money we get for tuition from the Commonwealth, it will, it will deteriorate by around 20%. It, you know, depend, depending on the discipline, it's a little lo lower or, a little, or somewhat higher than that. And it could be 20 to 23%. Um, there is no way that if we're trying to run a quality operation that we'll be able to absorb that. So we will be passing on um, to students um, that burden. And we are sorry about that, but there is absolutely no option other than that to do. Um, on the other hand, I would just, and I think you can uh, guess it from, what I'm, from the tone of my remarks, that we're actually not seeking to opportunistically gouge students. We will actually be very, very watchful indeed of our cost basis, um, because we have to ensure that the place runs in a, runs in a proper way financially. Um, but we will be very attentive to implications, and that is why the consequences, the consequences of the, the new model uh, are very important to us, particularly as they affect students. Because it is not just the increase in tuition costs that will be the issue, it will be the cumulative burden that is faced by students who are also seeking to live. There are some things in the package that the federal government I'm just um, putting these slides up so you can scan them. There will be some things in the federal budget that I think the government may be prepared to negotiate on. Uh, one of those issues may well be the interest rates um, that students are required to pay. But I don't know that the government will, at the end of the day, negotiate on the design of the help system, even though everyone is encouraging them to consider that matter. Uh, as you know, depending on the discipline which students study, um, the, the, co the government contribution varies. It's a very small contribution indeed already in respect of law and business, and, and a more significant contribution in other disciplines. There has been some real craziness in the new decision making, and I'm not suggesting that it's particularly willful politically or anything like that. These things sort of happen. Um, it is not smart strategically nationally that there is such a penalty being imposed on, agric on agricultural science, which we do not teach. It is just not sensible if Australia is positioning itself uh, as, a, as a food bowl uh, for, um, for Asia. That's not particularly smart. The treatment of environmental sciences, I think, needs to be reconsidered. So what the government has done, it's rationalised the current eight, sorry, it's, it's rationalised the current eight cluster system of disciplines 
down to five. It may play around the boundaries with, with that arrangement, but it will be a zero-sum game. That is to say, there will be no more money left. In fact, it'll be a bit more than that. There'll be no more money left beyond the amount of money that each allocation, that each university collectively receives. But each university will then be able to make its call on whether it wishes to follow the federal guideline or wishes to make a variation. So, for example, uh, the federal contribution to Discipline X might be $5,000. We, we might decide to burden students in one discipline more heavily against another. That's actually a very good relocation of blame. But it's actually something that we'll have to consider quite carefully. We're not rushing into this matter, but we understand that there's a fairly serious timetable uh, at work here. Um, we all, you all, we're all interested in major events like TS Expo. We're all interested in open days. We're interested in the student population in schools, the parents and the teachers and the principals having the best possible information base. Well, right now we don't have that information base. And the package is not likely to be determined, yes or no, by Labor or the Greens. It's going to be determined by the views on the day of the Palmer United Party. Uh, I greet that prospect with some degree of enthusiasm um, because I'm sure they'll be a very predictable force with which to negotiate. But putting that all aside, that's not meant to be entirely a cheap shot, but it, it is meant to actually explain just how complex the political process will be in the next few months. But at the end of the day, do I believe there will be a deal? I do believe there will be a deal. Because new governments in their first year get their budgets through. And whether or not you like new governments in their first year, they probably deserve to get their budgets through. So our job is to try and protect the edges, to try and ameliorate impacts that we think might, be, might not have been thought through. Uh, and also remember that one budget um, doesn't determine the entirety of future, that there will be a need, and government will recognise that there'll be some finessing required of, of the model. So people often say, well, do you like the new model? Well, personally, I don't like it very much at all, but that's not relevant. That's not relevant. We're dealing with it, and this sort of place is a sort of place which will just get on with it and make the best of it. We'll certainly be attentive to the potential consequences for our students, as I've said. Um, with all of this, of course, the university's been considering its own position. Um, it used to be the case, I'm sure in schools you feel the same, that we used to have five and ten year plans. Well, we have a document uh, which started out to be a five year plan called the Blueprint, and in ten years we've had four of them. This is the fourth. There's a copy in each of your folders tonight. So you might reasonably say we're, we're not very prescient, but, you, but it also might be read that the landscape is changing very quickly and profoundly. And we're dealing with that as we go, and we're dealing that with our researchers, with our teachers, with the transformations of the learning environment, which we're obviously pursuing very aggressively at this place, with the university's own ambitions. Um, we're looking at a whole lot of things that we didn't have to look at five or ten years ago. We have, we had a, we have a research income approaching $100 million now. That's, that's a serious, that's a serious um, uh, amount of money. Uh, but we've given some thought to the whole real world thing as well. And I know some people see it as a bit corny, but there's a real DNA in this place about the real world. Uh, and students understand it, staff understand it, but real world can't be static. And the real world we talk about in the latest iteration of the document is the real world of today and tomorrow, which is a very ugly, complex, volatile place where the skills of, of graduates are as important in terms of their ability to work in teams and work in environments as they are in, in terms of the discipline knowledge that they possess as they emerge. And they'll have to be adaptable. So we've tried to embrace that thinking. I say to staff in the place, if you don't like reading nine page documents, that's okay. Just read the first page and the next two, because that actually paints the picture. And I don't expect those of you who um, are principals in schools to, to devour the nine pages, but have a glance through and you'll, it does give you a, a sense of the character um, of the place and the pace of change, which we're experiencing in our sector as you are in yours. Uh, while all of this is going on, uh, and with students prospectively paying even more than they're paying now, um, the experiences of students are very important to us. Uh, we have a variety of, um, of mechanisms in, uh, whereby we 
we monitor uh, our students, and Susie Vaughan's here tonight, along with um, other senior colleagues uh, whose presence I acknowledge, and we can respond to any questions you have. But the Pulse um, survey is something we do two, two times a semester. And it's not just the thousands of um, statistical responses that we're interested in. We're interested in the longhand feedback that the students provide us, and they give us um, without dilution. Um, and, and, we, and we do we do value that a great deal. We've also moved to um, mandatory cod podcasting of um, uh, lecture or instructional activity. And says he bravely, it's mandatory. But uh, is everyone doing it? Well, not quite yet. Um, because I thought, well, while making, the bra while making the brave claim, we actually should monitor how we're going. Well, most are, but there's qu quite a noise level around how well it's being done in some parts of the university. We accept all that because you don't make these changes instantly and expect everyone to go along with it on day one. But, but, they, but that sort of expectation is a metaphor for what the students will expect of us and what we need to be able to provide an assurance that we're doing. Because at the end of the day, we want our students to become great graduates and to have great futures. Um, scholarships, I'm coming toward the end. Um, we've, um, I've, I've made mention, and the last slide deals with, uh, second last slide deals with that, um, with the whole question of uh, equity related scholarships, which will, will become uh, even more important. About two thirds of the scholarships that this university awards uh, are uh, social justice related scholarships, and about a third merit. We will be boosting the merit scholarships, both in terms of number and value, and a couple of other finessing arrangements regarding the scholarships um, for creative industries and elite, I think, are those that are mentioned there, are, are there, but we'll be in that game and continuing to be in that game very strongly. We're very pleased, indeed, that the uh, number of uh, scholarship applications has, has improved so dramatically, though we also recognise that we made our processes a good deal more simple, which, made, uh, which, which probably accentuated that, but we're still uh, gratified by that improvement, which needs to continue. Um, this is the last slide, um, or second last slide. It relates to um, the Learning Potential Fund, which I said um, we've been developing for, for 10 years now. We're the only university, though, I, I think we're all, all of us in the senior team are proud of this. We're the only university in the country that has such a fund which involves organic philanthropy. That is to say, the staff of the university in significant numbers, about 500 now, every fortnight, out of their payroll, make a contribution to that fund. And it doesn't matter whether they get 50 bucks, 100 bucks, or two bucks, they, they make a contribution. And staff are proud of that fund, students are proud of that fund, uh, and it's a very important part of the university's um, spirit um, and, and, and clearly a statement of commitment that we have. But the, um, we're, we're lucky we've got a jump start on the rest of the sector, but we'll need to build that very significantly over the next couple of years. Um, those of you who've um, been coming here for a while will realise the um, significant transformation that's occurred on the campuses, and uh, that's continuing. Um, Q Block, uh, Creative Industry Stage 2 at Kelvin Grove, um, will be complete this time in a year, which really caters for the performing arts. Uh, and this is an area that we had to invest in complementarily to the media and journalism components that, um, and other areas of creative industries that we've invested in to date. Q Block <coughs> is one of our rather less attractive buildings over there. Um, about 150 metres, cream uh, in colour by, by day, a very, a very large building. We had a good think about what we could do with it, and it just wasn't economical to knock it over, as um, <clears throat> might have otherwise be our preference. So, um, but, but what is going on in that building and renovation is very important. We're creating a super lab covering chemistry, physics, um, a whole reconceptualization of the, of the teaching of the, of the hard science disciplines, particularly those that I've just mentioned, um, as well as to provide social learning spaces. So we're happy with that. The D block, um, we use letters like that instead of names. D block is toward the front. It's the architecture and design building, and it's just a fabulous renovation. Uh, with, and the students, um, it's interesting these days, you will find it in schools. Uh, it's not officially open yet, but the students are using it. So. So they've declared it open, and that's all that's important, really. Um, so that's all I'd really like to say. Um, we are going to provide an opportunity later in the evening uh, for uh, you to ask your questions and raise your issues. I think we'll get on with having something to eat now. 
I won't introduce Stephen Harrington and John Banks uh, again. They'll just come up at the appropriate time in a little while and speak with you. But once again, <clears throat> on behalf of colleagues, I do very warmly welcome you to QT and do encourage your questions later in the evening. Thank you.